Hello, Mr. Reed. Craig Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see Love the letter to Zuckerberg. That's great. Yeah. Google needs one too, though. Oh, we sent one to all of them. Okay, good. Okay, good. Google, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Apple. I sent one to Tim Cook. You just have the sample. Mm -hmm. They're all they're all sort of personalized. Good. And I think if you want the others, they have all of them available. We just put one sample letter in. Great. So yes. Uh, where is the thing about um, Mike Huckabee's uh, Chick-fil-A day? It is on the first one. I middle left, I think. Uh, it's right there. Yeah. That caught my attention. I had no idea. I, I thought what they did was they removed, I thought they set up a Chick-fil-A day Facebook page and they took the page down. Am I wrong about that? They removed his post. They, they just they, took his post down. They took his post down. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's laughable, but it's crazy. Got a spot for you. Anybody in the car here? You can do it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> this way, because it's the only disrupting one person. <laughs> Man, you guys did a good job on this, Jerry. This is more than I realized. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen it. I haven't yet, so let me take a quick look. Yeah, I'm um, Craig. Good nice to meet you. Good to meet you. Robert, it's it's very uh, comprehensive. Yeah, no, I'm eager to see it. I would ask you why, when you were on the commission, you didn't do something about this, but I know you didn't have the boats. <laughs> it's your fault. <point. laughs> I don't think any of us were doing anything wrong. Yeah, I left. See, I left uh, here. <laughs> so, so before, yeah. before it doesn't happen after. Uh, <laughs> so, so you can do it. So you get off the hook on that and start all the time. Thank you. Have y'all somebody gone out to lunch? Yeah.
Free speech is under assault in America, especially for those who espouse Christian and conservative viewpoints. And this is happening on the internet. In response to Silicon Valley's suppression of Christian viewpoints, Internet Freedom Watch is an initiative of National Religious Broadcasters, NRB, and we mean with this initiative to defend free speech. I'm Jerry Johnson, president of NRB, and I want to welcome you to this press conference, Internet Freedom, Rights and Responsibilities. I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank you for watching on the live stream. And here's what you can expect. In a few moments, we're going to hear from Senator Ted Cruz, from Robert McDowell, from Craig Straziri, from Ralph Reed, and we're going to have some time for question and answer. But first, I'd like to share briefly about why NRB, National Religious Broadcasters, is hosting the event, and I want to announce three initiatives today. NRB is nearing its 75th anniversary, and it is noteworthy for our association, which for many years has worked to defend the liberty of Christian communicators from government interference. It was actually formed in response to corporate censorship of evangelical radio ministries. During the years of the Second World War, the mainline Federal Council of Churches later renamed the National Council of Churches, unhappy with the success of evangelical ministers who purchased times on the airwaves, pushed for limited religious time slots provided as a free public service to go only to, quote, responsible religious broadcasters approved by local and national denominational councils like themselves. <laughs> The national radio networks at the time, NBC, CBS, and the Mutual Broadcasting System, were eventually persuaded to do just that and drop the popular, self-supporting evangelical ministers. NRB, National Religious Broadcasters, was formed in 1944 and moved swiftly to curtail that threat. Successfully, I might add. Seventy-five years later, today we have a new censorship threat, again, from the corporate realm. NRB members, like nearly every other communicator, engage with their constituents using the amazing and innovative tools of the Internet. The story of those tools if they, as they've developed, it's truly a testament to the power of free enterprise and innovation. And, I sincerely thank and congratulate the companies that have spearheaded the enhancement of the Internet ecosystem. However, I must also emphasize our alarm at the ever-growing examples of censorship of Christian and conservative viewpoints online, largely at the behest of small yet dominant groups of cultural elites, just like in the 1940s. In particular, tech giants like Facebook, Twitter, Google, and Apple have on numerous occasions bowed to the internal or external pressure of those who desire to expunge opposing viewpoints from the marketplace of ideas by recklessly, recklessly using nebulous terms, nebulous terms like hate speech and I put that in quotations because it's an accusation with a convoluted definition, but it has extremely grave connotations. For some time, we have watched and recorded examples of censorship, beginning with Apple's takedown in 2010 of the late Chuck Colson's Manhattan Declaration app that simply and respectfully expressed a range of common Orthodox Christian beliefs, one of which was about the sanctity of marriage. Facebook has also censored numerous posts and blacked out former Governor Mike Huckabee's page at a strategic moment. 
Google's YouTube has targeted users like Prager University, Prager U, and others. And Twitter has even sought to muffle the voice of a sitting member of Congress for referencing her well-documented pro-life efforts. These are just a sample uh, a, of examples of viewpoint censorship that grow in frequency month by month. In fact, the problem has become so serious that public officials are now taking note. For example, the Federal Communications Commission Chairman Ajit Pai said last week that edge providers, and I quote, routinely block or discriminate against content they don't like, end quote. For this reason, NRB Today is announcing three new steps to draw attention to these threats, and we hope to come to, come to a resolution that honors America's fundamental principles of liberty. First, we are launching a new website today, Internet Freedom Watch, internetfreedomwatch.org. That will be a clearinghouse of resources to document cases of Internet censorship, as well as to allow those who've been censored to tell their story. One of our resources is the chart displayed here this morning, delineating examples of documented viewpoint censorship by tech giants. It's also in your handout. This chart will be updated online on an ongoing basis. Second, today we've sent letters to major tech giants, Facebook, Google, Twitter, and Apple, to urge a constructive conversation and a resolution to these threats. You have before you an example of the letter we are sending in your handouts. As you'll see, we wish to honor these companies for the good they've done and to express appreciation for when they've interacted in mutual respect with us. But we also want them to acknowledge there is a problem and to commit to solving that problem. Indeed, we call on these platforms to afford their users nothing less than the free speech and the free exercise of religion rights embodied in the First Amendment as interpreted by the U.S. Supreme Court. That standard, the result of two centuries of American jurisprudence, would enable the rightful blocking of content that, for example, threatens violence or spews obscenity without trampling on free speech liberties that have long made the United States a beacon for freedom. Third, while we hope tech leaders will take the opportunity to right these wrongs, today, NRB is calling on Congress to hold hearings very soon to look at the severe problem of viewpoint censorship on the Internet. It is no secret that many now view these seemingly ubiquitous platforms to be nearly as vital to their communications as the telephone was in the 20th century. We are not at this time calling for new laws or regulations. Indeed, we are very cautious about heavy-handed government actions dangerous to speech and innovation. However, it is unacceptable for these titans to discriminate against users just because their viewpoints are not congruent with ideas popular in Silicon Valley. This problem deserves scrutiny and thoughtful consideration from the people's representatives. So I will close with this. Our chart, here it is, you've got it in the handout, tracking examples of online viewpoint censorship tells a sad tale but I hope it will lead to a brighter future. I firmly believe we are at a pivotal moment. Now is the time for corporate powers of the day to safeguard the future of the truly open Internet by proactively and publicly declaring a robust and unapologetic stand for the free speech rights of their users. Now, we're going to hear uh, from Senator Cruz and our distinguished guests. Our first guest, Senator Cruz, not quite here yet, is he? Very close. He is very close, we're all told. Well, I think what we'll do is 
not wait. Um, I think we'll start with our panelists. We'll just go down the line. We're going to hear from Commissioner Robert McDowell. And Commissioner McDowell is currently a partner at the international law firm Cooley, LLP. He is highly rated, highly regarded, former commissioner of the FCC. He has been at the forefront of many complex and groundbreaking issues facing telecommunications, not the least of which have been spectrum and internet issues. Everyone's talking about those things today. Indeed, Commissioner McDowell is a leading advocate for internet freedom. Notably, he served on the U.S. delegation to the 2012 World Conference on International Telecommunications, where he exposed and then helped defeat an international bid to regulate vital aspects of the internet through multilateral treaty-based organizations. We thank you for that. Commissioner McDowell is also a defender of First Amendment freedom, and we at NRB particularly thank him for his dedication to ensuring policies like the infamous Fairness Doctrine do not gain new life. We are grateful and honored to have you with us here today, Commissioner. Please come to the platform and speak. Thank you. Want me to come up there? Yes. So the people on the street can see it. Well, thank you so much, and it's a great honor to be here. And if a Senator Cruz shows up, I will quickly sit down and let him speak because I know uh, he's probably got to get back for votes. And uh, Merry Christmas to everybody. It's wonderful to be back here before national religious broadcasters. And when I was a commissioner, uh, it was always a great honor and privilege to be able to uh, work with you all on a variety of issues. And um, so your very kind introduction, uh, I'm a, actually a recovering unelected Washington bureaucrat uh, back in the private sector, released back into my natural habitat. Uh, it's great to be here with this distinguished panel um, as well. And this is a, a very important issue, and there are some thorny aspects to it. And you, you mentioned the Fairness Doctrine. Um, and let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, both my parents were journalists. Uh, they met in journalism school at the University of Missouri right after World War II, uh, back when journalism meant trying to find all the facts and uh, present them and let the uh, reader at the time uh, uh, decide and make up their own opinions. Um, and uh, they were uh, uh, very strong about that. So I grew up with the dinner table talk of them editing the newspaper that they were re reading. You know, that was back when we had morning and evening newspapers and things like that. Um, so the notion of uh, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, but also freedom of religion um, was uh, very fundamental in the household that I grew up in. And so the First Amendment uh, was uh, uh, an important part of my mission as a commissioner. I was very honored to have received the Media Institute's Freedom of Speech Award. Um, and I was the only, the, at the time, the only, the second uh, sitting commissioner uh, to have received that award. Since then, there was a third, uh, Ajit Pai, two years ago. Uh, actually, a year ago, sorry, uh, received it. And I was honored to give the, the speech that uh, gave that to him. Um, so uh, back when he was Commissioner Pai, now he's Chairman Pai. And the senator is here. This is perfect. So I'm going to step down. I know my job. Senator, good to see you again. Last time I saw him, I was, it was my very last oversight hearing before Senate Commerce. Uh, and we were talking about uh, things such as uh, trying to get the uh, Disclose Act implemented through the FCC and how we were going to fight that together. So it's great to see him. I'll shut up and sit down and let you uh, get to the senator, and then I'll resume my comments right, later. Thank good. you. Okay. Well, in 2012, Senator Ted Cruz was elected as the 34th U.S. Senator from Texas. I'm pleased to say I voted for him in the primary and in the election. He is a passionate fighter for limited government, economic growth, and the Constitution. Prior to his election, Senator Cruz had the distinction of being the youngest, longest serving, and first Hispanic Solicitor General of Texas, where he was victorious in a number of high profile cases. Now in the U.S. Senate, Senator Cruz serves on two Senate committee, committees particularly relevant to today's topic, the powerful Commerce and Judiciary Committees. In those posts, he has been a champion for liberty, battling ghosts of the Fairness Doctrine, which doesn't seem to want to die, standing up for Internet freedom, and leading the charge in efforts to uphold the integrity of the Bill of Rights. We are thankful for your stalwart 
defense of free speech and religious liberty. Senator, we're blessed to have you with us this morning. Come right now to the platform and uh, tell us what you think about internet censorship. Let's welcome Senator Ted Cruz. Welcome back. Well, good morning. What a pleasure to be with you this morning. And, and let me say to the many friends in this room, thank you for having the courage to stand up and do what's right. Thank you for having the courage to defend freedom. If we think of the history of our nation, ours is a nation that was built on a miraculous revolution. And the revolution was not just one of arms. It wasn't just one of guns and bayonets. It was a revolution far more fundamentally about ideas. It was a revolution that took what mankind had been told for millennia, which is that power emanates from the top. Power emanates from kings and queens and monarchs. And rights, such as they were, were to be given or taken away like crumbs from the table of the ruler. For much of the history of mankind, that had been the understanding of sovereignty. The American Revolution was predicated on two fundamentally different ideas. The first was that our rights don't come from government. Instead, our rights come from God Almighty. As the Declaration put it, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and that they are endowed, not by a king, not by a queen, not even by a president, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those words were revolutionary. If your rights come from God, then government has no business interfering with your rights. If your rights come from government, then of course government can do with them what they please. The second revolutionary idea at the very origin of our nation was inverting the notion of sovereignty. Instead of being told that sovereignty resides at the top with the ruler, with the monarch, we began this country with the fundamental understanding that sovereignty resides with the people. We the people. That's how our Constitution opens. It is not the government setting out the rules for the people, but rather precisely the reverse, the people setting out the rules for the government. Those ideas are profound. And you know, when it comes to religious liberty, religious liberty and free speech, they're not niche ideas. They're not, oh, some people care about that. There is a reason that religious liberty is the very first liberty protected in the very first clause in the First Amendment to the Bill of Rights to the Constitution. That ordering was not accidental. It wasn't alphabetic. Without the right every one of us has to seek out and worship God Almighty with all of our hearts, minds, and souls, to live according to our faith and our conscience, no other rights are allowed to flourish. You know, if government can snuff out your right to worship God, what other right is safe or secure? We saw in the preceding administration what it looks like when those in power manifest a consistent hostility to religious faith. We saw from litigation against the little sisters of the poor. You know, it would be difficult to come up, even for Saturday Night Live, to come up with a more absurd example. Number one, you've got the little sisters of the poor. Nuns <laughs> who've taken a vow of poverty, who devote their lives to caring for the poor and the needy. In this narrative, we're told they're the bad guys. 
this point, the Saturday Night Live script writers would say, oh, we had a problem with this story. Wait, wait, wait. Why are you casting the nuns as the bad guys? What, what? This, this seems confusing. But we had the federal government, the government of the United States of America, litigating against the Little Sisters of the Poor. Why? Because they wanted to force the nuns to pay for abortion-inducing drugs. I have joked many times, a really good rule of thumb. If you're litigating against nuns, <laughs> you're probably doing something wrong. <laughs> By the way, this will work. I mean, just write it down, put it in your wallet any day, get up. Okay, litigating against nuns. No, don't do that. There are certain basic rules of life that you can just, it's really 100%. Don't litigate against nuns in any circumstance ever. It really will serve you well. It's like an angel getting his wings and, the, and bells ringing. Same principle. It's Christmas time. One of the things I'm very gratified about with this new administration is that we've seen a very different approach to religious liberty. We've seen a very different approach to the Department of Justice moving ahead to end the litigation against the Little Sisters of the Poor. We saw just this week an important religious liberty case being argued before the U.S. Supreme Court. And the Solicitor General of the United States, a dear friend of mine, standing not with those attacking religious liberty, but standing up for faith. That's good. Standing up for our rights to live and practice according to our faith. And I will say one of the most pernicious things that was quite common in the Obama administration was characterizing religious liberty as the right to worship. There's something very pernicious in that. The right to worship. So one hour one day a week, in Sunday, on Sunday in church, the government will allow you the right to worship. The rest of the day, Sunday and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, don't you dare behave as if your faith has any relevance to anything you might do outside of the pews on Sunday. That was the approach of the administration. Over the past several years, I've been blessed to host a number of religious liberty rallies, to meet heroes, to meet people who stood up and defended their faith, to meet Coach Kennedy, high school football coach, who had the temerity before each game simply to drop to a knee and pray. He was fired from his job because the school district determined there would be nothing more horrifying for teenage boys to see than somebody praying. I'll say this, the NFL could learn something about taking a knee <laughs> from Coach Kennedy. Religious liberty is fundamental. And hand in hand with that is free speech. Mm -hmm. We're living in a strange and censorious times. We're living in a time where the hard left has determined any idea with which they disagree, they will not attempt to debate. They will not attempt to dispute. Instead, they will silence. Earlier this year, the Senate Judiciary Committee hit, held a hearing on free speech on campus. It's truly dismaying instance after instance after instance of the 1960s leftists who have now taken over our college campuses. And apparently, free love man didn't include free speech man. Apparently, they've decided it's too hard to argue with ideas they might disagree. So instead, they'll simply muzzle conservatives. Someone who dares to speak out. Someone who dares to speak out for life. Someone who dares to speak out for traditional marriage. 
someone who dares to speak out against radical Islamic terrorism, those are ideas that are no longer permissible in far too many college campuses. And the thing for all of us to remember, the free speech protections in the First Amendments, they, they were not designed to protect popular beliefs. You actually don't need the First Amendment for popular beliefs. The free speech protections of the First Amendment were designed to protect unpopular beliefs. They were designed to protect speech that may be right or it may be wrong. One of the most famous free speech cases in the Supreme Court concerned the Nazis in Skokie, Illinois. The Nazis wanted to march in Skokie, Illinois, and the Supreme Court quite rightly said the Nazis have a right to march in Skokie, Illinois. Now, the Nazis are unambiguously evil. They are bigoted morons spreading hate, anti-Semitism, and evil. And yet, they have a right to say their stupidities. By the way, just like litigating against nuns, that's another very good checklist. Nazis bad. <laughs> it, it just always, always, always works. You, you, you don't have to think, you don't have to give it any, it, Nazis, okay, they're bad. If you get it all confused, just remember the end scene in Raiders with the fate when the guy's face melts. <laughs> Nazis bad, that's why their faces melt at the Ark of the Covenant. Really works well. But even the most rotten Nazis have the right to speak. And by the way, when they speak, all of us have a moral obligation to condemn what they're saying. I agree with John Stuart Mill, the best cure for bad speech is more speech. Shining a light, shining a truth. It's why these petty tyrants at colleges and universities fear actual meaningful debate. You see these students complaining of trigger warnings. I might encounter an idea that scares me. Goodness gracious, I thought the entire point of going to college was to encounter ideas that challenge you. You know, when I left Second Baptist High School, I came up east to Princeton University, Harvard Law School. My father referred to my time up there as missionary work. But listen, when you are taking classes from Marxists, and I took classes from a number of Marxists, it challenges you. It's a good thing. I signed up affirmatively for classes taught by Marxists, not because I think Marxism is right. I think Marxism is one of the most evil ideologies ever propagated. It has been used to oppress and torture and murder millions of people. Remember a fellow in my dorm had a poster up on his wall of Che Guevara. I think it was sophomore year. And I went in, I said, hey, that is, that's really awesome. That's, that is terrific. You know, have you thought of maybe putting a Hitler next to it? Yeah. And, and maybe Pol Pot, Mao? I mean, I mean listen, if you're going to celebrate a brutal and vicious murderer, why go small ball? I mean, there have really been some vicious monsters in the world, so let's, so let's put them all and, and, and hold them up. But, you know, Che was good looking. He didn't shave much. He looked like a movie star, so, so that's chic. I confess, for me, that hits a little bit home. Because my dad fought in the Cuban Revolution and was imprisoned and tortured by Batista's goons. And my aunt, my Tia Sonia, fought in the counter-revolution and was imprisoned and tortured by Castro's goons. Somehow when your family has seen the heel of a boot, my father's teeth, many of you know my dad, my father's front teeth are not his own because at the age of 17, his teeth were kicked in with an army boot in a Cuban jail. Torture and oppression becomes less cute 
when you see it firsthand. But the censorship we're seeing, we're seeing it on college campuses, but we're also seeing it on the internet. The internet is a marvelous, wonderful creation. What is it one of my colleagues said? A system of tubes. <laughs> I, for one, am very, very grateful that Al Gore invented the internet. <laughs> it would be a different world. The internet, you know, if you are a believer in government power, the internet's dangerous. Government power means you've got to have control over the people. The Internet sprung up on this notion that freedom would prevail on the net. The Internet has been a vehicle for extraordinary free speech, for people saying suddenly, you know, we're in the National Press Club. It used to be you had to be at a certain distinguished institution. You could be at the New York Times, and I am a reporter. You could be at CBS News, and yes, now I'm in the fourth estate. With the internet, every person with a computer. Anyone remember what ended Dan Rather's career? A bunch of bloggers in their pajamas who actually said, wait a second, what he's saying isn't right. Now, if you believe in centralized power empowering 330 million people to be their own reporters, to have their own platform to speak, that's terrifying. If you've just got three networks, you can all agree this is what the news is. It's accepted. It's the only thing that you can consider. <laughs> On the Internet, however, if everyone can speak. Now, you're going to get some stupid things said if everyone can speak. I really could live the rest of my life without seeing another video of some cat <laughs> chasing a ball or dancing in the mirror or whatever other ridiculous thing somehow they get cats to do on the internet. I did see a study, I think something like 89% of internet traffic concerns cats. <laughs> By the way, there is another stat which is 62.5% of statistics used in casual conversation are made up. And for the press, for the fact checkers here, the cat one was too. You sometimes have to help because the whole joke concept really, really eludes them. The internet has served as a haven for free speech. And it served as a haven for entrepreneurship. The barriers to entry, you know, it used to be you wanted to start a business. You wanted to start a business, you needed a facility. You needed production. You needed a warehouse. You needed distribution. You needed advertising. All that takes money. Well, if daddy owns a bank, you'll do pretty well on that. But if you happen not to be the children of rich parents, then the startup capital to start a business is harder, harder to get. What the internet has done is dramatically democratized and revolutionized small business. Why? Because if you want to you make a product, start making it. Put up a website. Boom, suddenly you have a national or even international portal. Your customers all across the country can instantaneously reach you. You can speak to them. You can advertise in a scalable way to decide exactly who you want to advertise to and where. And with FedEx, you have a distribution system that you can send, send your product to anyone in the world. Religious broadcasters. And let me say thank you to religious broadcasters who bring the word, bring the good news to people every day. You know, it used to be if you wanted to start a radio station, that was an expensive proposition. Had to go get a physical facility, put up a tower, pay rent, pay taxes, get government licensing. 
It's not an inexpensive endeavor. If you want to be a broadcaster right now, sit down at a computer, record a podcast, put it out there, you can reach millions of people. What a phenomenal transformation that is. That anybody who has a good idea has a vehicle to connect with anybody else. And if the idea is good, it can, it can flourish. Well, if we know anything about government, we know that government, those in control, like power. There are an awful lot of regulators in this town who look to the internet and it drives them nuts that their sticky little fingers aren't all over regulating everything that is said and everything that is done on the internet. I believe in a crazy idea that the internet should be free. The internet should be free of regulation, free of taxation. Leave the internet the heck alone. I don't want Washington bureaucrats deciding what's going to go on the internet. Net neutrality, there was an Orwellian word. Net neutrality, in 2015, the Obama FCC rolled out net neutrality, this wonderful idea that said they're going to use 80-year-old legislation to regulate the internet as a public utility, treat it like Ma Bell, an old telephone company. By the way, talk to young people, say Ma Bell, see how, any of them, how many of them have any idea what it is. They won't. What was it I saw recently? Someone was showing off some beautiful photographs they'd taken. They had a 35 millimeter, beautiful, very nice, expensive camera. And the person said, you know, what, 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 what'd, you, what'd you take it with? And sh showed them the 35 millimeter. He says, oh my goodness, that's the ugliest phone I've ever seen. <laughs> Net neutrality was the Obama FCC declaring the authority, the lawless authority, to regulate the internet, to regulate pricing, terms of service, terms of delivery, which, by the way, is everything on the internet. That's the entirety of the internet. The Obama FCC said, we have the power to regulate it carte blanche. And what happened? The big tech companies cheered. That should surprise nobody. Government power is very good for those who are already entrenched in power. Big business does great under big government. Big tech does great under big government. Why? Because what gov big government does is it calcifies everything. Whoever's on the top stays on the top, and whoever's on the bottom stays on the bottom. Freedom's disruptive. You know, the famed economist Joseph Schumpeter referred to creative destruction. One of my favorite things you can find on the Internet is a picture of the founders of Microsoft. 1978, Paul Allen, long hair, beard, looks like one of the Bee Gees. Bill Gates has glasses the size of hubcaps. They're all a bunch of college dropouts and hippies. And it says, just, it says under it, would you invest money with these guys? And by the way, they were taking on Big Blue, IBM, a behemoth, unshakable, unstoppable. It was absurd to take on Big Blue. And the creative destruction of the American free enterprise system let them topple Big Blue. Now they're the behemoth. And a wonderful, wonderful thing is there are scores of new barbarians at the gate. When government regulates everything, it freezes everything in place. Why? Well, who do the government regulators listen to? They listen to those with power. They listen to those with lobbyists, those who lunch in Washington. I've always found lunch odd as a verb. <laughs> Lunching can be a very dangerous thing. 
But the little guys, if you're just starting, you don't have a lobbyist, you don't have time or money or interest in wasting your effort lobbying. Now, if the internet is totally free, who cares? You want to put up a website selling something? You don't have to get anyone's permission. You want to start a podcast? There's no board you have to go to to apply for a license. Here's the pod I'd like to cast. You just do it. That drives people in this town nuts. But we need to be defending freedom. And I will say, you look at big tech. You look at big tech now in the revolving door between Democratic administrations and big tech. How many senior Democratic officials suddenly become, get cushy offices in Silicon Valley? And you start looking at the conduct of big tech. The giants today, the Googles, the YouTubes, the Facebooks. And we're seeing them behave like governments. We're seeing them behave like the petty tyrants on college campuses. In December 2015, a professor at Northwestern University conducted a study analyzing Google, search results. He searched for the names of all 16 presidential candidates and discovered that Democrats on average had seven favorable search results among Google's top 10. Republican candidates, meanwhile, had 5.89 positive search results. Let's talk some specifics of what he found. Hillary Clinton had five positive search results on the first page and only one negative. Donald Trump had four positive search results and three negative on the first page. Bernie Sanders had nine positive results on the first page without a single negative. And the junior senator from Texas who found himself in that race as well <laughs> had zero positive results on the first page. That professor ran another study summer before the election, found the vast majority of news outlets represented in the Google search were liberal-leaning. Fox News was represented 1% of the time. Do you search Google? Google, please tell me what a bunch of leftist Democrats think. Boom! Except I think they assume that's the beginning search. 2016, it was revealed that Facebook was curating the list of trending news stories. What a kind term, curating. Just, just caring for it, just curating. No, 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 not that, not that one, not that one. Oh, yes, go, 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 go. <laughs> Facebook workers were artificially spiking stories, conservative stories, including stories about IRS official L Lois Lerner, no, 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 the pre people don't possibly want to know about a government official targeting them because of their faith, because of their political views, because they happen to support Israel. No, that's not news. Nothing to see here. Move on, move on. Former Navy SEAL Chris Kyle. Positive stories about conservative politicians, although those are hard to come by. Conservative outlets like the Washington Examiner and Newsmax They were popular enough to be picked up in trending stories according to the algorithm on Facebook. But they were excluded, nonetheless, until the New York Times and CNN began covering the same stories. So it's very simple. You want something covered on Facebook, just convince the old gray lady that it fits her politics. Last month, Twitter barred Representative Marsha Blackburn from advertising her campaign launch video because it deemed a line about efforts to investigate Planned Parenthood to be, quote, inflammatory. Yes, I agree. Saying that an institution makes money from selling the body parts of unborn children is inflammatory. You know what's also inflammatory? making money from selling the body parts of unborn children. Yes. But apparently Twitter deemed the body politic too fragile. 
you can't say things like that. No, 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 no. We, all good liberals, support this. Susan B. Anthony List recently had a video advertisement against a Planned Parenthood, uh, against a political candidate, blocked on Twitter, because it referred to partial birth abortion as being akin to infanticide. Who could ever get that idea? Now look, for the sake of, 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 of this point, it doesn't matter whether you agree or disagree. I happen to agree with those sentiments, but the beauty of this country is you're entitled to agree or disagree. It's what you do with that agreement or disagreement. What you're not entitled to do is muzzle the position, silence, censor the position you disagree with. YouTube, taking conservative speakers down, Prager University, wildly popular. Speakers addressing topics, somehow YouTube magically shutting them down, those they found inconvenient, inconsistent with their politics. Every day, more and more Americans are getting their news, getting their political news, not from pieces of paper, not from their televisions, but online from social media. One of the biggest shifts that has occurred in recent years is the locus for power in media is no longer New York City. It's Silicon Valley. And Silicon Valley has the ability to put a thumb on the scale in a far more subtle and insidious way. New York Times, they can write stories that are wildly liberally biased. And if you don't know when you pick up the paper they're wildly liberally biased, you probably never will know. They don't hide who they are. It might be easier if they put Pravda at the top, but they don't hide it. But on the internet and social media, it's far simpler. Because views that are unfavored simply disappear. They simply don't exist. What? You did a search. You found the results. What's your problem? And by the way, views they like, they magically bubble to the top. Well, it looks like everyone believes this. Now, listen, all of these are private companies. They're private companies. They're not bound formally by the First Amendment. First Amendment applies to state actors. But when they are media companies, and every one of those tech companies are media companies, now they are the new media powerhouses, I think they have a moral obligation yes. to defend free and open communication. And I think we have a right to call them out for that moral obligation. And I will point out, it may be a little bit more than a moral obligation. Recently, we had representatives of the big tech companies testifying before the Senate Judiciary Committee. And I asked them a simple question. I said, do you consider your platforms to be a neutral public forum? And you saw the GCs start to do backflips. I kind of thought maybe they saw Russia one coming to the next Olympics. They were auditioning for gymnastics. They didn't want to answer that question. Is your platform a neutral public forum? Well, it's interesting they didn't want to answer that question because there are powerful consequences to the answer to that question. Right now, under existing law, the Communications Decency Act protects all of these companies from liability. Federal government has legislated putting in a protection from liability for what is said on their sites. And what's the basis for that protection? That they're neutral public forum. They're neutral public forum, so you can't blame them for what people on their sites say. They're not the ones speaking. It's whoever's commenting on Facebook. It's whoever's tweeting a thing, so you can't possibly hold them accountable. They're simply putting up a forum for others to speak. That's the predicate Congress used to act, to preempt law, and to grant a major immunity from liability. Well. If these institutions are no longer acting like neutral public forum, 
if they are engaging directly as active speakers, as political players putting a thumb on the scale, saying we are Democrats and we want liberal ideas to prevail. They have a right to do that, but you know what? If they're not a public forum, it seems to me Congress needs to reconsider whether they should get the gift of immunity of liability for being a public forum. You can't have it both ways. If you're an active speaker, then guess what? You are responsible for what you're saying. The whole predicate of not our fault was we're not speaking. If you're engaging saying, I like these thoughts, I don't like these thoughts, that is the very essence of speaking. And so I want to commend you guys for the project you've launched looking at censorship online. It's powerful, it's pernicious, it's growing. And there are few things the censors hate more than sunshine. You know, I don't know if you know it, Jerry, but some of the members of NRB actually have broadcasting stations actually can get around and reach the people. That is powerful and it's dangerous and I commend you, shine a light. Defend freedom, defend freedom of speech, defend freedom of religion, defend the fundamental freedoms that have made America the greatest nation in the history of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, good work. Just Thank you, Senator Cruz, for reminding us of First Amendment principles of freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and that really is the foundation from which we are voicing the concern today. Well, now part two of Commissioner McDowell. Will you return to the platform and let's do it. Well, that's a tough act to follow, uh, Senator. Um, so. <laughs> I'll also, but the, you know, the good news is it helps truncate some of what I was going to say. Uh, so I was ticking things off with little notes I'd taken. Um, I will say, he, he, at one point, he brought up Ted Stevens from Alaska, uh, by the way. So I'm wearing an Alaska tie. This is a, uh, someone who sells their ties over the internet, made in Alaska. And if you look closely, it's a little map of Alaska. But one of the reasons is when I got up this morning, I was reminded when I was a commissioner of one of the favorite things I did was during the digital television transition. You may remember that was. That happened in 09, but in 08 and 09, we were working on raising public awareness of uh, getting free over the air people, uh, uh, consumers, uh, transition to that. And one of my favorite places as I traveled to 22 markets across the country was in North Pole, Alaska, the home of KJNP. Uh, and this is an internationally famous religious broadcaster. And so, as you know, west of the Mississippi, all the call signs, all the call letters uh, start with K. Um, but they uh, had theirs to mean, so KJNP, King Jesus of the North Pole. <laughs> and um, uh, they had TV station and radio station. Their AM signal uh, on those cold Alaska nights would bounce off the ionosphere. It could be heard as far away as New Zealand and Australia. But anyway, I, for some reason, I thought of them this morning. And it was just a great time, and it's a funny little log cabin out in the middle of nowhere, um, uh, but uh, lots of wattage. In any case, as the senator said, and let me, let me uh, give a little quick history, because I know we're, uh, I'm eager to hear from our other panelists and engage in Q&A, um, is sort of the history of censorship, uh, the First Amendment, what it means, but I'm going to really compress that because he covered a lot of that. Um, so censorship, first of all, in no particular order, we use that in the vernacular to mean someone shouting down or filtering out or suppressing speech. As a legal term of art, and not to sound like a lawyer, but I am one, um, and I wish I could have gotten continuing legal education credit for his talk uh, right then, but because uh, there was a lot of constitutional law there. Um, but censorship, you know, Supreme Court reaffirmed this in 1983 in the International Brotherhood of, uh, Brotherhood of Carpenters case, is state action, as the senator pointed out. So the, the, the government trying to balance speech or force speech or amplify speech or suppress speech. And it's tried all those things. Uh, the fairness doctrine was mentioned. Actually, I think this is relevant here. 
uh, as we talk about the, this issue today. And uh, so the Fairness Doctrine came in the Truman administration in the late 1940s, back when he had fewer, broadcasting meant AM radio only. TV was very experimental. Um, and uh, there were about 700 AM radio stations throughout the country. That was broadcasting. Uh, and with the threats of communism and fascism, there were concerns of uh, communists or fascists owning radio stations or, or using the electronic media to uh, brainwash uh, Americans and, and get their viewpoint out. So the FCC, I think unconstitutionally, put through the Fairness Doctrine, uh, which said if you're going to offer up a political viewpoint, you need to offer up the opposing viewpoint. It wasn't exactly, it gets confused with the equal time rule, but it's all kind of the same idea. But nonetheless, so what this meant was instead of more political discourse, we had broadcasters saying to heck with political discourse because we could get fined, the FCC can take our license away. So what we're going to do is we're going to have shows on baking and gardening instead and things like that. And those are, those are meritorious and I like baking and gardening shows. But nonetheless, political discourse is, uh, you know, in, codified in, in the First Amendment. Political speech is core speech. But who was out there? Who was out there? Religious broadcasters. So religious broadcasters continued to do their jobs, as you all do so wonderfully. And many issues of morality uh, have something to do with public policy. Mm -hmm. And the only time the Fairness Doctrine was used to revoke a broadcast license was against, against a religious broadcaster. And this is a case known as the Red Lion case that went all the way up to the Supreme Court and was ruled in 1969. Supreme Court held that there's something called the Doctrine of Spectrum Scarcity, meaning at the time, we could only fit so many broadcast uh, TV and radio stations in the radio spectrum. And now engineers have, have blown this out of the water, right? So, we, But nonetheless, and the court said, so because there are only a few voices out there, the government does have a compelling state interest to balance speech. Uh, and it said, but if, if new competition comes online, uh, I didn't use that term, but uh, you know what I mean, uh, and has many meanings, uh, then come back to us. And we'll see. But in the meantime, yeah, we're going to go ahead and let that religious broadcaster lose their license uh, because they violated the, the Fairness Doctrine in the eyes of the FCC. And the FCC has been used as a place by both Republican and Democratic administrations to punish enemies and reward friends uh, because it, I think, is the, the number one agency that does affect speech. So when we talk about censorship on the Internet, and, and the senator did a very eloquent job of, of talking about the need to keep the Internet freedom enhancing and open. And that's one of the things I fought for as a commissioner. And I'm always very wary of the government trying to come in to balance speech on any platform. And this is where it gets to be a, a thorny issue and complicated when we, if we're all defenders of free speech. It's great to say to have the government balance speech when your friends are in power. But as he pointed out, every four or eight years or so, your friends might not be in power anymore. And so the power you just handed to the government to balance speech, to amplify your message or suppress your opponent's message, can be used against you, right? So that's the word of caution uh, I'm preaching uh, today. I I'm delighted that you're launching this initiative. I think there needs to be more attention brought to it. And I think at the end of the day, and I'm gonna uh, truncate my remarks so we can move on, you, merely the fact you're shining a spotlight here has a curative effect. This is good for freedom. This is good to get uh, some of these companies you've cited to think more about it. And they've been scrambling and thinking more about it, especially in the past 12 months, just coincidentally. Um, but um, I would you know, offer a word of caution, which you did in your opening remarks, and the Senator did too, about mm -hmm. going to the government and asking the government to start to balance speech. Because what's going to happen after you, your friends aren't in power, let's say? So. One way we've seen folks uh, be responsive to these sorts of things is through business. Is this good for business or bad for business? Uh, do you want more people looking at your platforms? And these are private platforms built with private risk capital, started in dorm rooms, and you know, gone on to be billionaires, but they can be disrupted. The, the internet is a dispersed marketplace. It's decoupled, loosely coupled. Uh, just the, the actual engineering of it defies centralization and top-down authoritarianism. That's why, why authoritarian regimes uh, revile the internet, because it threatens dictators' holds on, on power. And that's why you see efforts 
by Iran and uh, Russia and other countries to try to get the International Telecommunication Union, an arm of the UN, to try to have a centralized regulator, worldwide regulator for, for the internet. And that's uh, what uh, Jerry referred to that I fought against. So because it's that way, that actually gives evangelicals a great opportunity to reach a broader audience. But when you see uh, companies, uh, as you believe, that are, that are distorting searches and, and things of that nature, um, then I think you need to make a business case for that. And uh, that starts with doing what, exactly what you're doing. You're exercising your free speech rights. Uh, so let's hope that the, this message and this effort gets out into the mainstream uh, press a little bit um, and gets a lot of people thinking. And I look forward to uh, congressional hearings and, and more thoughts on this as this becomes a growing a growing story. So I will conclude it with that. Thank you very much. I look forward to the, the other uh, panelists and the uh, Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner McDowell, uh, for the context, for the caution, and the strategy note. And we'll talk about those things later. Next, we're going to hear from Ralph Reed. He's long been an advocate for the values that uh, evangelical Christians cherish. As executive director of the Christian Coalition from 1989 to 1997, he built one of the most effective public policy organizations in recent political history, a real harbinger of what was to come for conservative Christian public policy engagement that has flourished in the decades since. Ralph is now founder and chairman of the Faith and Freedom Coalition, as well as the CEO of Century Strategies. And he's here in that context, and there he's also had opportunity to engage on behalf of liberty, particularly the online environment. Ralph, we are eager to hear your thoughts. Come to the platform and uh, welcome. Jerry, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really uh, honored and grateful to be a part of this very important forum. First of all, I want to commend NRB and Jerry, your leadership. Uh, the National Religious Broadcasters has been one of the most important organizations in the last half century or longer in preserving and protecting the right of people of faith to share the good news over the airwaves and now over the Internet. And the rise of the so-called electronic church in the last, you know, 70 or 80 years has been one of the most important and transformational developments uh, in the history of the Christian church, quite literally. And I'll talk a little bit about that and why what you're doing, Jerry, with this Internet Freedom Project is so critical. There have really been three developments in modern history that have transformed the ability of Christians to share their faith. The first was in the 1450s when a German printer by the name of Gutenberg printed the first Gutenberg Bible. And if you have not already done so, I commend to you a visit to the Museum of the Bible where you will see that that development took the scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, that had previously been limited in their dissemination by technology, by the fact that they had to be written out by hand, and as a result of that, it was very laborious, very time-consuming, very expensive. And outside of the clergy, most of the rest of the human race was literally illiterate. And therefore, they did not have access to the good news of God sending his son to die on a cross for their sins so that they could experience the fullness of his grace and mercy. This was not just a technological development. This was a spiritual revolution. And it has been so significant that in the intervening five centuries, there has been no book in human history that has been printed and distributed more than the Holy Bible. So the relationship between the ability to spread the gospel and technology and the rise of movable type and printing presses are inextricably linked. Let's now fast forward to the 20th century and the invention of the television. 
In 1946, there were 10,000 televisions in the United States. 10,000. By 1960, there were 50 million. Today, uh, roughly 92% of all households in the developed world are television households. That number is only 42% in the developing world. There are 1.7 billion television households in the world today. And without going through all of your many distinguished members, whether it's the Christian Broadcasting Network, the Trinity Broadcasting Network, uh, Michael Youssef's uh, ministry, what is that, Leading the Way? Yes. Uh, I can't go through them all. But there are people all over the world who were never directly exposed to the gospel, including, by the way, in tyrannical Muslim dictatorships who today have access to the gospel. I can remember when I was then working for Pat Robertson and the Berlin Wall fell. Um, I was 12 at the time. <laughs> and uh, Pat and CBN decided to strike while the iron was hot and to do what they had not been able to do under the Soviet regime. And that was to go into Russia in a big way. And they went in in the form of animated Bible stories, because that was the easiest way to get it in. And so they were literally on prime time in Moscow with Superbook and Flying House and other animated features. And the mail that poured in from people who were exposed to the gospel message was so great that Moscow postal workers decided that rather than give them their mail, they just gave CBN all the mail and asked them to return what wasn't theirs. That's the power of television. The internet is going to be more powerful than mo both of those yes. two mediums, more powerful than the movable text and the printing press, more powerful than television. Think about this for a minute. In 2004, when Mark Zuckerberg, who was then, I believe, a sophomore at Harvard University, started Facebook, the original idea was that you would just have an online directory of students. That's all it was. The night he flipped the switch, this is 2004, there were 450 users at Harvard University, 450. It quickly spread to three other campuses and was incorporated in Palo Alto in 2005. By 2006, there were six million users on Facebook. Today, this is what, roughly, um, I don't know, what, 12 years later? There are 2.77 billion social media accounts. And Senator Cruz and Jerry, the handout that you provided earlier, document in a way that I really don't need to, although I, I, I assume this, this stuff is on, on the website, it is. right? Uh, the website that you're launching today. I, I'll just talk about ones that I'm familiar with. We've already talked about the discrimination against Prager University uh, and the taking down or the blocking of the videos. I, I'm not sure if the whole channel has been blocked or if it's just certain videos. Um, but for Marsha Blackburn's announcement speech, I want you to think about this for a minute. Her announcement speech announcing she was going to run for the U.S. Senate. This is among the most protected speech in American history. Somebody who is seeking an office, it's political speech, it's uh, under the First Amendment, it's sacrosanct. Because she criticized Planned Parenthood and talked about her actions to prevent the taxpayer funding of illegal activity, including the buying and selling of fetal body parts, that video was blocked. Now, beyond the fact that it's political speech, I want you to consider this for a minute. What Marsha Blackburn was referring to in those remarks was her attempts to enforce U.S. law regarding the prohibition on the trafficking of fetal body parts. 
she was also talking about the efforts that she undertook to stop the taxpayer funding of the taking of innocent human life and the organizations that take human life. Now that position, that taxpayer funds should not be used to take innocent human life or to fund organizations that do it, is in a July 2016 Maris poll a position taken by 62% of the American people. It is the official platform of one of the two major political parties. It has been the official policy of the United States since the Hyde Amendment was adopted in 1978 by a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate and signed into law by a Democratic president. And that law and that policy has been upheld repeatedly by the U.S. Supreme Court. So by prohibiting that speech, that shows you how this content discrimination against conservatives, against Christians, against pro-lifers, against supporters of Israel violates, if not the First Amendment, certainly what we believe is essential to the conducting of a healthy democracy. And I would also point out that uh, in taking down uh, these videos at Prager University, YouTube and Google have also discriminated against a lecture by Alan Dershowitz, who is not a conservative, about the founding and the prosperity of Israel. So this is discriminating against speech that defends the right of Israel to exist. And we meet this morning on the day after the President of the United States has recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and has announced the move of the U.S. Embassy to uh, Jerusalem. I retweeted out a White House video on this. I wonder if I'll be treated the way Prager University and Alan Dershowitz have. So I just want to say, Jerry, I commend you and NRB for doing this. I don't think we know yet. I don't think NRB is advocating yet what the answer is. But if we're right and the internet will eclipse television and the printing press as the most important technology for the sharing of the gospel in human history, then it is critical for Christians and others of faith to be able to share their faith in an unfettered way without fear of persecution, harassment, blocking, or discrimination. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ralph. Um, great insights. Now, we've mentioned Prager University several times, and uh, we've saved the best for last, I think, because um, you want to see what this really looks like when it happens to you. And that's, that's what we're about to hear from Craig Straziri. Craig is the Chief Marketing Officer at Prager University, Prager U. He joined them in 2015 to lead the organization's branding marketing, and overall growth efforts, and he has increased PragerU's online audience by reaching over 80 million Americans in the past year, with over 60% of them being under the age of 35. He and his colleagues have made PragerU a top go-to source for conservative ideas online. Notably, in 2016, Google's YouTube has been restricting access to dozens of PragerU's educational videos deeming them, quote, inappropriate for young people. Well, Craig has been the direct point of contact with Google, so we're going to be very interested in hearing more about his experiences. Thank you for being here today, Craig. You come. Let's welcome Craig. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good morning. It's truly an honor to be here. I would like to thank Dr. Jerry Johnson and the NRB uh, for inviting me. Uh, this is a very important event. I'd also like to thank my fellow panelists, Ralph Reed, for mentioning our PragerU issue, uh, as well as Senator Ted Cruz. It was great to hear him mention the PragerU issue that we've been dealing with. Uh, public awareness is very important. It's one of the most important things for this topic, and the fact that it's on his radar is important. 
In case you haven't heard of us, PragerU is a conservative educational nonprofit that reaches millions of young people every day on the internet. We do this via short five minute videos that are fact based, sophisticated, clear and concise, and often feature very well known presenters. We utilize technology and social media to educate young people about the values that made America great. Thanks to our marketing efforts, as Jerry mentioned some of our numbers, over, our videos are viewed over two million times every single day. And uh, next week, actually, we're expected to surpass one billion lifetime views, which is unheard of in the conservative movement. One in four Americans at this point have seen a PragerU video, and that number continues to grow. Because of our reach and impact, though, we've obviously caught the attention of Google and YouTube. PragerU videos are available on many different platforms, one of the primary ones being YouTube. It was a little over a year and a half ago we first discovered that about 15 PragerU videos at the time were being restricted. Restricted mode is a feature on YouTube that is supposed to block violent, sexual, pornographic content. Many parents and families use restricted mode to keep this type of content away from their children. Schools, universities, public libraries, places of employment also use restricted mode across their browsers. And YouTube has decided that our educational videos meet those, uh, those guidelines of either violent, sexual, or uh, pornographic, which if any of you have ever seen a PragerU video, it's almost laughable, but you know they contain nothing of, these, uh, of this nature in the guidelines that YouTube has. Some of the titles of videos that have been restricted are Why Did America Fight the Korean War? A five minute talk from scholar Victor Davis Hansen, uh, the most clean and appropriate discussion on the history of the Korean War, and YouTube has restricted young people from seeing it. Um, as Ralph mentioned, Israel's legal founding by Alan Dershowitz, who is by no means a conservative, they blocked that one. Uh, Charlie Kirk, who's the head of Turning Point USA, a fantastic student, uh, boots on the ground activist organization, he gave a video for us on uh, the need for diversity of thought, diversity of viewpoint on college campus. That was restricted. Um, many of our videos that discuss terrorism have been restricted, while YouTube claims that you know, they, they're on a mission to make sure that ISIS doesn't use the internet to propagate. They're actually restricting our videos, which explain what their ideology is anti-ISIS, and they restrict ours. So none of these, and oh, there's one more I would like to mention. Unfortunately, there's too many. Uh, but Dennis Prager's video, our founder, on the Sixth Commandment, Thou Shall Not Murder, was restricted for a while. It's not currently restricted, but for many months, it was restricted. Uh, you know, YouTube doesn't want young people to know that murdering is wrong. I don't know what the logic is, uh, but uh, it seems odd that they would restrict that one. When we first discovered what YouTube was up to, we contacted them immediately. We filed an official complaint and uh, started a relationship and a dialogue with them, hoping it was an innocent mistake or an error in an algorithm, uh, and we're hoping to resolve it. Uh, that's when we were sh told by YouTube shortly after they, they looked at our situation that they reviewed our videos and deemed them inappropriate for young audiences. And of course, we have this in writing. Over the past year and a half, I personally have been in communication with YouTube and Google staff members about this issue. Um, I've uh, had been in email conversations, had phone call conversations, and they even invited me to their offices in New York to discuss any issues we may be having. Not only in this year and a half of dialogue has nothing happened, they've actually continued to restrict more and more videos. There's now nearly 40 PragerU videos that are being restricted out of our 250. It's a, it's a big portion of our library. We have in writing from YouTube that they had teams of people review our videos and still, de still deem them to be inappropriate for young people because they, quote, discuss mature topics. However, even their vague and broad uh, uh, use of the word mature topics doesn't even hold up. As ridiculous as that is by itself, even that doesn't hold up. For every one of our videos that's restricted, there are thousands, and in some cases, millions of other videos on the same exact topics as ours that are not restricted, many of these being, being from uh, large leaning, left-leaning uh, channels on YouTube. This shows clearly that it's not the topics, that, the mature topics that they're trying to restrict, it's our viewpoint in the videos. One quick example on the Korean War video, our Korean War video is restricted, but if you type in Korean War, even with the restricted filters on as young people use YouTube, uh, there are many videos on the Korean War and a handful from left-leaning sites. So the answer is rather obvious. YouTube has restricted PragerU videos for one reason, and that's ideological discrimination. Of course, YouTube is owned by Google, which was founded to, ironically, as their mission statement says, organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. That is their mission statement. 
and as Senator Ted Cruz earlier mentioned so eloquently, when they hold themselves as a public forum, they are subject to, to scrutiny under the First Amendment, and they can't have it both ways. YouTube has made some of our most important videos inaccessible to the very audience we try to reach, young people. This kind of censorship is what we've seen on college campuses for years, but it's far more dangerous in the, in the circumstance because the internet is where the world goes to get information. Google is now a verb. You Google it and you expect to find the information you're looking for. Can you imagine if the left owned the internet the way they own the universities? Can you imagine what the world would look like if Google can continue to arbitrarily censor ideas they simply don't agree with? This is why PragerU has filed lawsuit against YouTube and Google last October. We are not fighting this just for PragerU. We are not fighting this just for conservatives. We are fighting this for all Americans and for freedom of speech. Fighting back against Google was not an easy decision for PragerU, but someone has to take on Goliath. As our founder, Dennis Prager, often says, goodness without courage is useless. We at PragerU are full of courage and we're fighters, so I'm proud to be a part of that team. For me personally, again, it's great to be a part of this because it's what's right. I love my country. I have always loved this country from the time I was a kid, and I am grateful and lucky to be an American. I have a massive American flag in my dining room, thanks to my wife for letting me put it up and her parents for buying it for us. But every time I walk through my kitchen, I see that flag, I get the chills, I feel lucky to be here. I love this country. And that's why myself and others on my team are fighting this fight, because it's important for America. I have three little daughters. Uh, yes, I still want a son, by the way. And I want them to grow up with the same opportunities and liberties that I had. I want them to grow up in a world where they can access information and different points of view and make their own informed decisions on important issues. Unfortunately, in today's world, Google is a primary source for pretty much all Americans online. And when they censor or control the information that people could see or restrict access to videos like ours to young people specifically, it's very troublesome. We have an online petition at PragerU.com urging the public to stand up. And as of now, nearly 400,000 people have signed it to show their support. Of these 400,000 people, they're not only conservatives. We get emails on a daily basis from people saying, we don't agree with all of your videos, but we think what Google's doing to you is wrong. It's time to stand up to big business and big tech, Google and YouTube, and fight for what is right. If you want more information or to support our efforts, I encourage you to visit PragerU.com. Thank you again. So we're going to take about 15 minutes. Thank you, Craig, and uh, conclude uh, with some Q&A. Ralph, I know you have to leave, but I wondered if there was a, a concluding thought. You know, you certainly make the rounds in the conservative and Christian community. What are people saying about Facebook and Twitter, or is there some other observation you want to make out the door? Uh, well, real quick, I would just say uh, that um, I think it is essential that as many people as possible join in the Prager University effort, the online effort. Uh, I think that this is the tip of the sword right now because this is clearly viewpoint discrimination. I think the other thing, Jerry, without presuming to tell you how to do your job because you're more than capable of how to do that, I know for a fact that your members have the ability to shut down any switchboard in Washington or either, any other major city <laughs> Uh, in America on, on command. And if they share with their viewers what's going on and how, I, I can't remember if we mentioned this or not, but when Mike, I think you mentioned it, that when, uh, when the uh, CEO of Chick-fil-A came under attack, vicious attack, including the boycotting of his company uh, city council members in Chicago prohibiting Chick-fil-A from opening stores in the city of Chicago simply because the CEO of that company expressed in an interview an orthodox Christian view on marriage. Mm. That was it. Not advocating that anyone be discriminated against because of their sexual preference or orientation, I'm personally, I live in Atlanta, so I'm a pretty big Chick-fil-A <laughs> fan. I have never seen an instance where somebody walked up to a counter at Chick-fil-A and asked for a number seven with an iced tea, and they asked you whether you were gay or straight. Doesn't happen. No. Because, huh? Their business went up. Yeah, their business went up. <laughs> they believe in serving everyone. 
That means liberals, that means conservatives, that means gay, straight, feminist, con you know, everybody. Yeah. That's their Christian service. They want to serve and love people. All he did was give his personal view on marriage. And so Mike Huckabee urged people to, I think he proclaimed it Chick-fil-A Day. Yeah, go, bye. And said, go. Now, I don't know about the rest of the country, but in Atlanta, the lines to get into Chick-fil-A on Chick-fil-A Day were so long that there were, there were lines that stretched down exits onto the interstate. People were so, that all happened organically online. Mm. That was not done by the company. It was not done by a top down. It was totally organic and 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 uh, viral. And Facebook said that that was in effect hate speech and took it down. Okay. And uh, that kind of thing is going on. And whether it's through hearings, shining a light on it the FCC looking at it, or us just having a grassroots protest movement, we need to end it. We need to put an end to this, and we need to force these companies to be responsible and fair. Thank you, Ralph. Yes. yes. And you can find that example and others like it in the folder that we've given out and online. I know you have to slip out when you do. That's fine. So the panel will consist at this point with... Uh, Craig and Commissioner McDowell and with myself, and actually we have some members of the press here and others, um, I have some questions for these folks, but I want to make sure you've come from the press or, or guest. If you have a question at this point, I want to open it up. So state uh, your name and what uh, organization you're with and uh, ask your question. Yes, right here. We got a microphone here. Thank you. Uh, Josh Shepard with the stream. Um, I have actually several questions. So I found this conversation absolutely fascinating. Um, but I will start with you, Dr. Johnson, if you could. Um, you represent thousands of religious radio stations, um, most of which feature you know, only perhaps orthodox Christian viewpoints on their platforms. So how are the policies of those, these internet companies different than the policies that are practiced by those radio stations? Sure. Well, I think that's a great question. I used to host a uh, drive time call-in show in Dallas, and uh, we took uh, calls. I, I substitute now for Tony Perkins on Washington Watch regularly, and we take calls. So, you know, we take calls, and we love opposition calls, and often I would call for the opposition to call in. So we really wanted to engage, and dial so we have many call-in shows. So I would say there are formats that, um, you know, provide that kind of uh, an opportunity, and we don't censor anyone. Um, but uh, the, the key difference, though, to, back behind your question is uh, Christian broadcasters generally have statements of faith. Um, they have uh, creeds or doctrinal statements, and they don't pretend to be. These, these groups do not pretend to be some kind of a uh, public square. Um, you know, I think when people Google, they're expecting, you know, the dictionary or the equivalent of an encyclopedia, uh, or Wikipedia, is something like, they're expecting some kind of objective results. And, uh, and they present themselves that way. And Facebook says, you know, this is, a, this is where you have community. This is where Americans have community. And so they are pretending and presenting themselves to be something that in fact, maybe they're not now, they're not delivering. So I would say that's the key difference, truth in advertising. Uh, Christian broadcasters are advocates for Christianity and the Christian worldview. These companies, you know, are supposed to be social media and, and again, present themselves to be open. Good question, though. Uh, yes, identify yourself. Uh, yeah, Monty Taylor, Communications Daily. Um, uh, Commissioner McDowell, you support what Chairman Pai is planning to do with uh, net neutrality. Senator Cruz says that he supported it. Uh, part of what they're doing is predicated on the idea that market forces will keep ISPs from discriminating against speech or, or throttling back people from various sites. Why aren't market forces taking care of it here with the edge providers? Well, it may ultimately, and I think yeah, it's so great to see you again, by the way. So, and, and just so folks know, net neutrality doesn't have a legal definition, so it's a, an amazingly coined term. 
what actually is happening is Title II of the Communications Act of 1934 is being taken off of broadband internet access providers, so your wireless company, your cable company, your broadband provider. That happened only in 2015, um, and so this is being reversed uh, not even 36 months uh, later. Uh, so that's important, and the, the idea being, I'm sorry for the long lead in Monty, we'll get to your question, and you may have to remind me what the question was at some point, but uh, that you can keep the internet open and, and freedom enhancing through three other very powerful uh, statutes, federal statutes. There's the uh, Sherman Act, the Clayton Act, and the Federal Trade Commission Act, plus a variety of state laws for unfair competition, deceptive trade practices, et cetera, and, and even the trial lawyers. Um, nonetheless, okay, so that's that. Uh, the internet will remain open and free in, in a year from December 14th. Let's have a state of the net uh, uh, symposium and we can uh, see just uh, how wonderful it actually is. Um, so uh, in my 2010 dissent when I was a commissioner, uh, when the FCC tried a similar thing, uh, I, I dissented against that and I actually had a whole section on the First Amendment. Um, and uh, it's true that in uh, 2008, the summer of 2008, I, I called um, attempts to regulate internet network management um, the fairness doctrine for the internet. And I could see where the slippery slope was, was headed. I, I'm not that smart, but I, you know, I don't think you need to be that smart to see where that was headed. So uh, these are private platforms. Um, it be, uh, the last mile of internet access has become more powerful and more competitive because of wireless connectivity. The internet's gone mobile, and so the average American consumer has a choice of at least four, or 90%, I should say, uh, of American consumers have a choice of at least four uh, mobile broadband providers, plus there's unlicensed spectrum. So that gives you, in other words, more conduit uh, through which to uh, uh, disseminate your information or opinion or whatever it is, your content. Um, so the, f the courts are loath to look at a, first, at a constitutional question if it can, when something's appealed, like let's say from the FCC, hypothetically, uh, if they can reach a statutory uh, question first. But the First Amendment has loomed behind that debate as it does with almost every other FCC policy decision. Um, and so private platforms do have a right, do have editorial discretion. Uh, and this may not be you know, the, the, the popular thing to say in this room. And this is where the issue gets thorny. So whether you're trying to say you're a common carrier and neither ISPs or edge providers want to say that they're actually common carriers. Sometimes common carriage gives you the benefit of immunity, right? So in the old Ma Bell phone system, if Al Capone was, and by the way, the 1934 act that the FCC put on the internet, you know, it was designed when phones were held in two hands, uh, so that was the state of communications back then. If Al Capone were to call one of his hitmen to murder somebody, Ma Bell didn't want to be held liable for that. They didn't want to be say, hey, we're a third party, we were a co-conspirator, right? So that's kind of the basis for that. Um, so everybody in this space, everybody in the world, we're all guilty of this to a certain degree. We want the benefits without the obligations or responsibilities. We want certain benefits without having obligations and responsibilities. Um, and that's in part what's going on in the internet ecosphere. This will be a public policy debate for quite some time, but I am ultimately a believer that this glass is half full. I am an optimist, especially in this space, which is so dynamic, it changes yeah. so quickly, um, and there are so many workarounds uh, that the market, market forces will help. So merely shining the spotlight on uh, PragerU's uh, allegations of what, uh, what uh, has happened or may have happened uh, helps, right? Having people such as yourself, Monty, report on this helps. Certainly having a congressional hearing helps. Um, and what's being said here today, I think, is the internet should be a space for all points of view. And if it's going to be neutral or objective, uh, then you want to make sure all players are playing by those rules. But I'm a big believer that the market will help equalize that and we need to be very careful and very cautious of asking the government to come in and balance speech, which I don't think it can really do under the First Amendment. Um, but uh, even if it survives for a, a few decades like the Fairness Doctrine did, you need to be very, very careful. Mm. So that's my main message today, Monty, is just be careful what you ask for in terms of asking for the government's help. Okay, we have uh, other questions. Yes, in the, Jim, who you could, who you could recognize? You're the communications man. <coughs> 
Hi, thanks to you all for being here today. I'm uh, with Washingtonian Magazine. Um, so I wanted to ask you a question, Dr. Johnson. Um, we know that this isn't just a one-sided issue. Um, many think that Facebook actually aided the president in his election, um, whether that's through hoaxes like Pizzagate or um, you know targeted ads linked to the Kremlin, which we know um, existed. So I wanted to know if you think there is an ideal solution that would address both sides of the issue. Well, I, I'm very sympathetic with uh, what Commissioner Dow McDowell has been saying, and that is, uh, you know, the ideal solution would be a market-based solution. And that's why we've written the letter today, and I encourage you all to take the letter that I wrote to Zuckerberg and Cook and all of these leaders to say, hey, we're calling attention to this, this is a problem. I mean, we're still very early in the day when it comes to the Internet and all that's going to be happening. Uh, I, I think we have no idea where this is all going, just in terms of um, um, the way we live. So I, th I think there's a lot of room still for them to adjust. But what we're saying is this is becoming a problem. And I mean, obviously, I think if um, foreign governments are pushing um, propaganda to affect elections, that Facebook should be able to, to take a look at that and screen and filter and put up a warning. I think that's, that's appropriate. But that's not what we're talking about with PragerU. We're talking about uh, open agenda, educational content. It happens to be conservative. And it's not an accident now. I, I think you can demonstrate this is a clear, calculated a discrimination. And that's, that's not right. That's really not who Facebook or Google, let's say in this case, and YouTube, that's not who they say they are. And, and I think that's where the market thing can come into play, as we just remind, either this is who you are or that's who you are. Make up your mind if you're, uh, you're going to allow public educational videos or not. Because if you're not, we need to move on to another, another kind of provider. Some, there's, a, there's a market vacuum for the next YouTube. But they're so big now and ubiquitous. And, you know, I have to say this. Um, we are not calling for a specific solution yet, but it is intriguing. When we began the John Milton Project uh, several years ago, which is a prototype of all this, it was very clear as we talked to Heritage or AEI or other conservative groups, you know, we do not want to ask the government to get involved. But there is a change in tone, and I, we keep hearing the cautions, yeah. and I'm thankful for that. But people are talking about monopoly and trust law and other things. But they're, they're thinking there's got to be some solution. So I, I do think the market solution is the best solution. And I, I say it frankly, shame is, is part of the, I think, ingredient here to say, let's have some hearings on the Hill, in the Senate, in the House, to say, this is what's happening. You, you should at least answer for it. And uh, I hope that's helpful. I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, some of you had questions. I hope uh, some of our speakers will uh, actually um, take those on the way out for a few minutes, but we, we have to be out of this room at 11. So uh, what I want to say on the behalf of NRB today, thank you. And remember the three things today that we're doing. We're announcing the website, um, internetfreedomwatch.org. Take a look at that. We've sent the letters to the social media companies. Take a look at those. And uh, we are calling for hearings in the Senate, in the House, on this kind of uh, private censorship, this, this new kind of censorship. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank the panelists again, if you would. Thank you, Commissioner.